Those of us who follow Jesus have always had an uneasy relationship with government and politics. Sometimes we're asked to open in prayer at a rally or a convention. We're, we're brought into places like the Oval Office and given special access or souvenir photos. But at other times, we're not even in the room, not consulted, not included. And that's just the way Jesus promised it would be. Christians in the culture would be the ultimate outsiders. But what happens when Christians, tempted by access and special treatment, and maybe even see a law to pass that we support, become insiders? What, what happens when we're just another member of the team wearing a red or blue jersey? How do we maintain our witness to the truth that the gospel is for everyone? How do we avoid gaining the world but losing our soul, our integrity, and our right to object? Stay with us. Our guest tonight is to some controversial. Google the name Russell Moore and you'll see why. He's an evangelical Christian leader, traditional in his beliefs about who God is, certain about sin and our need for the Savior, Jesus Christ, and convinced that faith leads the followers of Jesus to act, to protect the weak and stand up against injustice and feed the hungry. But a few years ago, when Russell decided he wouldn't give certain politicians a pass or lower the bar for other leaders or reduce the role of Christians in politics to just another block of votes, votes that could be traded or bargained away, he was, in a word, canceled not by unbelievers, but by Christians. Today, he's a minister, th theologian, and editor-in-chief of Christianity Today. And his new book is an attempt to help fellow, Christian follow fellow Christians, Christ followers, replace the religion of politics with a relationship with God. Russell Moore, welcome to State of Independence. We're honored to have you on the program. Well, thanks for having me. Good to talk to you. R Russell, what's the difference between a church taking a stand against evil and, and becoming something of a branch office of either political party? Well, I think one, one test for that is to say, am I always completely uh, with whatever side I'm on in, in the politics uh, or uh, the political or cultural worlds? Uh, because if your side is 100% right, um, it, it probably isn't because they're 100 percent right. It's probably because there's a kind of idolatry that's going on. Um, and so it, it's, there's always a temptation uh, whenever we're engaging uh, to be co-opted. That's always been the case uh, from the beginning of time. But that's especially true at this moment in American life right now in which uh, politics has just become kind of a, a cultural tribal identity marker and people line up in their in their herds then it becomes especially dangerous, I think. Yeah, so, you, you, I mean, you're, you're talking, what you're saying is so on point. Uh, you know, I, 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 I talk to some of my Christian friends who are heavily involved in politics, and I, I always try to remind people that at the end of the day, when we, when we meet our Lord, that we're not going to be, we're not going to be, our, our life's not going to be judged on how good we were as Republicans or Democrats, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, and, and, and no, I said this in an interview on cable network news uh, that, you know, the side that I'm on isn't always right. And, and yeah. to some people, that, that's heresy. I mean, for me to, you know, to be a Republican and to say that my side is not always right is, is, is almost heretical. And, and, but I'm just trying to be a Christian. I'm just trying to be a Christ follower. And, and I know a lot of our viewers want to be Christ followers too, and, and hopefully are. Um, or consider themselves to be Christ followers. But at the same time, what you're saying hits hard because there are some people who will say, well, I'm a Christ follower and I'm a Republican and I, I'm mm -hmm. with my party. I'm, I'm with my party, you know, I'm with my party. I'm with my president, whoever that president is, if it's a Republican president, whatever my president says and does is right. And I'm with it 100% of the time. And, and that's just the way it is. And, and whether, whether that, whether what the president or my party is saying, lines up with my faith as a Christian person um, or the activities of some of my party line up with my faith as a Christian and what I say I believe and how I say I live, mm -hmm. that takes a, a back seat. And that, that to me is, 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 a, is a terrible and sad thing. Um, you've been speaking to that. I think you talked some more to me about that. Well, it is a, it is a ter terrible and sad thing. And one of the things I've noticed is that Christians particularly who are the most effective in government and politics are those who hold it lightly, uh, those for whom losing an election is not an existential threat, because they're the people who aren't making the politics ultimate. 
And in a time when people are trying to ask politics to fill the role of meaning and belonging and identity and religion, politics just isn't meant to bear that weight. And what it leads to is the kind of exhaustion that we're facing all around us right now. I mean, every Every family I know is either tense or divided. Every church I know is either tense or divided. And it's the it's the same story repeating itself all over America. There's there's a better way than this. Yeah. I, I wonder, you know, if you're a pastor, how do you deal with this? You know, so the pastor has the challenge of one, I want to keep the church together that I've been called to lead. Uh, two, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, mm-hmm. And I, 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 I want to be true to Christ. First, but I know I've got people in my congregation who are Democrats and people who are Republicans, and the two don't see eye to eye, and and they don't like each other either, which is nuts. When when we, when when the scriptures call for us to love our neighbor as ourselves, and even to love our enemies, you know, if you if you would be so so inclined to think that somebody who's in the other party is your enemy, I don't believe that's true. But some people in America do feel that way about it. Uh, then. What is, what is, how does the pastor effectively deal with that without losing his or her congregation? Well, if a pastor has a congregation that has both Republicans and Democrats in it, he's already in such an unusual situation because the, the way that we're sorting out right now, uh, people are not just living next to people who agree with them politically, but uh, going to church with people who agree with them politically as well. So it's dividing up into not just red states and and blue states, but red churches and blue churches. And that's not healthy. Um, And I think one of the things that a lot of pastors are seeing right now is it's not so much that they have a political divide in their congregations as even if their congregation all agrees uh, politically or culturally, there will be a group of people who will say, unless you continue to get Um, more and more theatrically angry. And unless you say uh, whoever the other side is are a complete existential threat, then we're not going to be happy. And and then we see you as somehow uh, soft. And so there are a lot of pastors who are really trying to navigate that. And then you add to it the stresses that came upon the whole country uh, through the COVID pandemic and pastors who are having, I mean, I would hear this every week, of one group of people angry because the uh, COVID protections were too strict and another people angry because they weren't strict enough. And there are a lot of pastors who are, who are really at a point of exhaustion. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to me that I'll have a conversation with a pastor of a church and a member of Congress within minutes of each other. And they sound like the exact same conversation uh, where people are saying, I didn't get into this uh, for this. Uh, I didn't come in here to do uh, theatrical uh, outrage. I'm here because I care about the set of things. And that's not what the reality seems to be about right now. Yeah, what do you think about people who may accuse you or, or anybody who, who, who says this of just trying to make friends with evil, you know, just trying to, you know, you're just trying to make friends with the other side. You know, you're not really a, a, a b- believer. Uh, I, I know you're a believer. I mean, I know you follow Jesus, yeah. but what do you say to people who would criticize you? Because they would be angry to hear you say that you can be a Christian and be friends with somebody in the other political party. Uh, well, I would say let's spend some time looking at the figure of Jesus, uh, who who isn't um, who isn't saying, well, because the Pharisees are against me, that means I'm with Rome. Or because Rome is against me, that means I'm with the zealots. He's he's speaking a message of gospel, both in terms of repentance and in terms of, of mercy to everybody. And so if if in your mentality, Jesus Christ is a squish, you probably have lost your way a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about um, uh, theological conservatives uh, who are really big on issues like uh, uh, the right to life, you know, uh, the, the, the plight of the unborn, but who are less concerned with issues of poverty and disease, you know, the fact that people are homeless and the like. Uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say to, to them? Well, I, I find that there are a lot of people who are deeply concerned about the right to life and who are concerned about those issues of, of poverty. In a way, I think that sometimes people uh, don't really see because they're not the people who are on television talking. They're, they're out there actually doing the work. So if, if I go into a community and what I'm trying to do is to get a group of people 
to uh, care for refugees who are uh, endangered there. Uh, I'm, I'm usually going to start with the women who have been serving in the pro-life cause um, in terms of helping women in crisis, in terms of finding alternatives for them, because these are usually the people who have an understanding of human vulnerability um, and who actually are very different from what people think of as the political activists. But when it comes to all the rest of us, I would say, look, we, we have to uh, we have to follow uh, Jesus wholly. And uh, that doesn't just mean where what Jesus uh, where Jesus directs us, where that lines up with uh, our favorite politicians. Uh, they have to be judged in light of him, not the other way around. And I think that will lead to a, a kind of homelessness for a lot of people. Because what you're having to ask yourself constantly is, who's the neighbor that my people don't want me to see? Uh, who, who's the neighbor that it would be really convenient for me to make invisible? Sometimes it's the poor. Sometimes it's the elderly. Sometimes that's immigrants, refugees. Sometimes it's the unborn. You ask, uh, you ask that question of yourself, and that's never easy. Yeah. That, that always yeah. takes us uh, to the borders of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, t- tell me what your sense is of, uh, of churches. You know, there are some churches that say, well, you know, we are theologically conservative and we believe in, 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 in Jesus, and, and, uh, but we don't take an active role in, 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 in matters. And then there are churches that say, you know, to, to follow Jesus means that you've got to do something, that you've got to take a position, you've got to take a role, that you need to be active in the lives of people and, and feed the hungry and, 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 and clothe the naked. So, so what, what do you say to, to, to what do you say about the, the divide that exists between those churches? Well, I think in, in many cases, the instincts and the impulses are right. Um, in the sense that the people who are saying we have to be engaged are, are right. We can't say to ourselves, well, well, who is my neighbor? We have to be shaping and forming our consciences in terms of how we uh, operate in the world around us, including in the, in the public square. That's true. At the same time, though, there are all kinds of things that we're going to have uh, similar conscience motivations about where we're going to disagree on what's the best way to get there. I mean, I, I've been in a church one time where there was uh, two city council people in the congregation, both of whom were really concerned about single moms in the community who couldn't uh, care for their children. And one said, that's why I want to raise the minimum wage to this. And he gave an amount. And the other said, yeah, but I'm worried about uh, if we do that, that businesses are going to cut their hours and these moms aren't going to be able to, uh, to care for their kids. In that case, you have both of them with motivations that are shaped in the right direction. They just need to sit down and have a debate over how best to get there. That's very different from somebody who would say, who cares about uh, these uh, these poor people in our community? They're losers and takers or so forth and so forth. That's a very different reaction. So you, 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 I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, here's a, another question, though. Um, so, so how close should churches get to the political flame? You know, it's, it's very attractive uh, to, to be involved in politics. And, and we certainly have in America a, a history of, uh, of, in some cases, pastors becoming uh, members of Congress or becoming uh, U.S. senators and the like. We haven't had a pastor yet to, to get to be president of the United States, but, but we've had certainly a number of pastors or former pastors who become U.S. Me- members of the U.S. Congress and members of the United States Senate and, and, and maybe even a governor or two, uh, certainly a governor or two. Uh, Huckabee was, a, was, I believe, a pastor and became governor. And, and so um, uh, how close, in your mind, should, should we get? I mean, and, and where, do, where, where, does, where does the desire to serve uh, get mired in seduction because uh, I've worked as I, I think I shared with you for a United States senator and, and I, was, I was asked to run for Congress after I worked for that center and I, I won the primary but I lost in the general but I was endorsed by by a former president and by by the, the sitting vice president of the United States and by a couple of U.S. senators and and I know what it is to be in a, in a ballroom and to have a thousand people cheering for you and standing when you stand and sitting and, and, and listening, hanging on to your every word. It's, 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 and, and see TV commercials and, and, and billboards with your name and, and likeness on them. Very attractive stuff, um, uh, very heady stuff. 
Uh, but, um, and I work for a U.S. president, uh, and, and work in the White House is, 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 you get to be at the pinnacle of power, even as a staffer, and to see how it all works and the, the millions of lives that are touched, but also to see the challenges that the, that any U.S. president faces. Um, how close would, do you suggest, uh, should, should people get, if, if you're a, a pastor, um, uh, to that political flame, which is so incredibly attractive? Well, I don't know very many pastors right now who are aspiring to be in the political arena. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, more of them are saying they feel like they're too much in it just by trying to do their their callings as as pastor. But what I would say is our our job as the church is to cultivate people's uh, consciences and to help people to put ultimate things first. Uh, and wherever that gets confused, we're we're getting into a place of of danger. So what I I find more often than pastors are young Christians who are saying, "Am I should I be in the political arena? Uh, should I uh, run for state rep or or should I uh, serve in a campaign?" And what I always do is to talk to that person particularly to say, "What are your particular sets of vulnerabilities?" We need people of goodwill, including uh, Christians, uh, in the civic space and in the political arena, and we need a lot of them. But we don't need people who are making an idol out of winning uh, or of tribal identity. And so the the people I encourage uh, are not the people for whom this is the the be-all and end-all of their lives. They're the people who are able to say, I'm going to serve as well as I can, and when it's time for me to go home, uh, my primary identity is who I am in Christ, and I can live with that. Yeah, it used to be that way once upon a time. I mean, uh, uh, we we don't have a thing called term limits that that uh, right now, but but it's something that I thought would be awfully useful. You know, the the sense of it, I think, when the country was started, was that people who worked regular jobs, who were farmers and teachers and lawyers and had families and the like and business people, they would run for office, they would serve for a few terms, they would serve their, their neighbors uh, in, the, in the legislature or in the Congress, and then they would come back home to, the, to their job and to their neighbors, and, and, and their neighbors would say, thank you for having given, given of yourself and of your time, for sacrificing to do this. It's very different now. I mean, uh, people get there and they don't want to leave um, yeah. and, 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 and that's a, a very, very different notion. Um, here's, I, I know our, our time is precious, but I, I know there are people watching who are Republicans and there are people who are watching who are Democrats and who have thought to themselves that there's no way in God's heaven that anybody who is a Republican could get into heaven or conversely that anybody who is a Democrat could get into heaven. Like, you know, those people, that side, that group, there's just no way that any of them show up in heaven. And certainly if you watch some some shows on, 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 on television, uh, you would be inclined to think, yeah, that's true. Uh, but but what do you say to that? What do you say to our viewers to, tonight who are watching, who are saying, well, I'm a good Democrat or I'm a good Republican. And you know what? I, at the end of the day, I, I can't see how any of the other side makes it to heaven. What do you say to them? Well, I I would say to reconsider that uh, for the sake of your faith and also for the sake of your country, Uh, because if we really believe the gospel, then we believe that people come before God on the basis of uh, the the grace of God and the the blood of Christ, not on the basis of how their uh, how their voting uh, lines up with somebody else. And I also would say that for the sake of your country, one of the problems is that we don't actually know people. Uh, who differ with us in many cases, and there's no way of even having a conversation or trying to persuade one another. People who do often find that they're dealing with real human beings and not with caricatures, and just having those conversations is a good first step. When we return, I'll ask Russell about the provocative book title and how it's been received by fellow conservatives, especially his old friends and colleagues. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. He's the editor of Christianity Today and someone who is often at the center of the thoughtful debate about how close Christians should fly to the flame of party politics. His new book has a title that might sound like he's rejecting the faith of his childhood, but quite the opposite. 
Russell Moore, where did you get the title and how's the book being received among old friends in Christian leadership circles? Well, the, the title of the book really came from the old uh, REM song that, that tends to play whenever people are talking about those who are walking away from their faith and, and walking away from the church. Uh, but as I looked into it more, I found that's actually not what that old song, Losing My Religion, is about. It's about disappointment and anger, uh, using that old uh, Southern expression, I'm, I'm about to lose my religion, meaning I, I can't be uh, polite anymore, I'm, I'm angry. And what I found in talking to a lot of young people is that that's exactly at the, at the root of it. They've looked around and they've seen scandals, they've seen cover-ups, they've seen political idolatries, and many of them are wondering, is Christianity just that? Is it just a means to an end? And I went through that that crisis as a 15-year-old of wondering that. And uh, thankfully, I'd read the Chronicles of Narnia so many times that I, I could look to C.S. Lewis as a, a guide to bring me through that. And I'm just really concerned that there are a lot of people who are yielding to cynicism right now. And I don't think we should. I think we need to be honest about the crisis that evangelical Christianity is in. And if we don't, uh, we're going to we're going to lose something really important, but we don't need to end there. Uh, I think we need to lose our illusions, but save our faith and and keep uh, keep holding on to hope and renewal. Yeah, that that well, that's such a, a good and encouraging message. You know, the, the the secret, of course, is in the is in the sauce. You know, like how do we how do we get there? You know, how do we get to that point? If you look at where we are today, uh, you know, and, and where we hope to be. You know, where we're, we're, I believe God would have us, uh, which is, uh, I think, what you're saying, uh, you know, getting there is, is, is the challenge. I mean, even if we talk about, the, you know, pastors who are struggling with their divided church congregations or struggling with the fact that they have a church that's all one party and, and, and you know, and not the other, and that, you know, they're kind of heading in a direction they don't really want to head, but they don't really have they feel like they, they don't have what it takes to, to change that, to, to talk mm -hmm. to people without losing members, you know, which yeah. ends up being catastrophic. You know, so the, the challenge becomes, how do, how do we get there? I mean, how do we, you know, for you, you, you managed to, to, to get out of it. I mean, you, you grew up in, 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 in what, Biloxi, Mississippi, and, mm -hmm. and you happen to be somebody who was a reader uh, and, and who loved books, and, 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 and C.S. Lewis spoke to you. And, and, and that was really helpful for you. But what, what do you say in this world of social media where, you know, where we're in an instance, you know, on one of these social media platforms, somebody can be uh, canceled? Yeah, well, I, I, what I see as good news right now is that there are so many people who are at their limits with that who are really exhausted about it and who are saying, this, this can't be the way that I want to live. Um, and I think the good news about that is not necessarily that they have a seven point uh, roadmap. Uh, it's instead simply stepping back and saying, uh, this isn't the way we want to live. And, and I think what's happening is God is, uh, is kind of bringing people together who never thought they would find each other and realizing maybe some people I didn't think were my people, uh, we actually have a lot more in common than we thought. And I see that happening all over the place right now in the church and out. And in 30 seconds, is there any hope for us politically speaking? I mean, uh, certainly for people of faith. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're the United States of America. We, we, have, we have pulled out of dark times before. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm also cautious. I think we, I think we need everybody uh, involved in taking us in a different direction. Excellent, excellent. Russell, thank you for being so transparent with your story, and thank you for writing this book. I pray that God will encourage you today wherever he leads you, and, and you've certainly been a blessing to us today, brother. Well, thank you. Likewise. We'll be right back with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. And now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. I do think Dr. Morris is right in saying that we don't have a lot of relationships often in a Republican enclave or a Democratic enclave. You know, a family who has Republican family or Democratic family talks about that relative who is a Democrat. 
And then you add the a faith element to that and it gets even more complex because you really say, well, if they were, if they were close, the closer they become to the, the, the Lord, the more likely they are to become a member of my political party. The shocker is if they stay in that party or the sh other shock is when you find out that your Democratic friend or Republican friend is actually a kind person, yeah. a nice person. Or that I met a guy recently who was staying in his political party and he said, but it uh, doesn't seem like you line up with the platform. People are members of parties for different reasons. Culturally, yeah. it's where their friends are. Sometimes um, they, they, it was the, the party that they feel represented something that, that uh, they didn't see represented. You know, a certain kind of value, speaking up for working people, or in the case of Republicans, speaking up for the vulnerable, the unborn. Um, so it's, it's an important discussion because it is, when elections come around, especially presidential years, and you see the bumper sticker go on the car or the sign go up, somehow in our minds, there's a little asterisk or a discount that goes next to it. And maybe you structure a conversation differently and you kind of work around those uh, topics that are important topics in a normal conversation to have. So especially if you're a Christian, you should be talking about just about everything. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, I, 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 I love the fact that this book challenges us because uh, the tendency is to suppose that uh, if you don't agree with me right. um, uh, politically, that uh, clearly you don't agree with my faith, and uh, or you can't be, you can't have the same faith that I have, and 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 yet God's spirit in us produces love, kindness, yeah. gentleness, compassion, forgiveness, patience, yeah. you know, generosity, um, you know, all these wonderful things. And yet and still we ascribe to the other side the, the incapacity to be any of that. Yeah. You, know, uh, if, you know, if I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat, well, you know, Republicans, you know, I, I can see you as a Republican being that, but as a Democrat, I don't know that you can be. And that, that, that's not right. It isn't right. And it's an assumption that we have to wrestle with and deal with and, and pray about too. Yeah. Because when there aren't relationships between people that believe differently from you, guess what conversation really suffers? the conversation about the gospel. Yeah. Because if people who are different, who need each other, aren't talking, uh, there, there isn't an opportunity. You haven't earned the right to speak into other areas of life. So don't let the wall go up because it's painted blue or red and one side or the other. Well said, brother. Well, well said. Well, maybe you're not convinced that your Democratic or Republican neighbor has their head screwed on straight, but if you follow Jesus, there's only one way you're required to treat them with love and respect. Wouldn't that be refreshing if we all did that? If you're near your phone or computer, please send me a message to let me know what you thought of today's conversation in the comment box at joewatkins.org. We'd love to hear from you. From America's First Capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. For Jeff Coleman and the wonderful team at Lighthouse TV, thanks so much for sharing your time with us tonight. God willing, I'll see you next week. It's a great discussion and important. It, you, you have to look at your contact list and I'd say probably 20 years ago, 99% of my contacts were Republican. Joe Watkins State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different, made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.